Uh, hello, uh, and welcome to your next interview in this interview series. Uh, today, I, Lucas Medela, am joined by Amanda Bridgman, uh, who you might know if you've read The Subjugate, which is one of the books that we are using in our course uh, pretty often. Uh, so uh, welcome, uh, Amanda Bridgman, and uh, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Now, the first question we kind of ask everybody, uh, every single author we've interviewed, I think, is uh, would you label your own writing as specifically Australian speculative fiction? Um, in terms of it, in terms of me being Australian and being the writer of it, yes, I would. Um, I do um, specifically intend my work to be as uh, widely approachable as possible. So um, I often have international settings or certainly international characters. Um, the thing about if you make it too Australian, uh, you can cut off the wider audiences because some of the, some of the nuances of, of Aussie life, um, we're not all like Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> and some of, the, some of the, if you get too, too down to it with the, with the humour and the nuance, um, it might go over the heads of a lot of other people. But the truth of... Uh, Australian writers um, and Australian pop culture in general is that we are heavily influenced by the US and also the UK. Obviously we were settled by the by the English so there's a heavy influence um, on our pop culture by them and American pop culture is everywhere so we're, we're definitely heavily um, uh, influenced by American pop culture as well um, and just just add to that the the you know, specifics of living in Australia and that kind of adds our, you know, the Australian flavour to it, but we're very, very, very English and, and uh, US centred. So do you kind so of market I'm, yourself as Australian then or or is it kind of very book to book? No, I definitely market myself as Australian. I'm very, very proud Australian. Um, so definitely market myself in, in the, uh, my space opera series, Aurora series, um, the heroine is Australian and it's an international crew, uh, but I intentionally had the male lead, non-romantic lead, as, as an American um, because I wanted to reach American audiences. They are the biggest market, English market, um, that you want to kind of hit for business interest. So it does make sense, but it also has to make sense for the story. So this was an international crew, so it worked quite well. Um, in, in the Salvation series, which is the subjugate and the sensation. Um, obviously that's set in San Francisco. Um, so to pick up that book, you wouldn't know it was written by an Australian author, I don't think. Um, I have another novel, The Time of the Stripes, that's set in Virginia. So, um, and again, there's no Australian characters in that. So you, you wouldn't necessarily know an Australian has written that. So but do you think question? there are kind of other aspects outside of, of maybe the characters uh, themselves that kind of stick out as distinctively Australian in your writing or in, in other Australian speculative fiction writers' um, cases? I think so. I think, um, you know, sense of humour can, can, you know, infuse its way in. Um, and I think you, you can't help but bring in an Australian point of view to things. Um, for example, in the time of the stripes, um, there is, you know, the, the kind of topic of, of gun control and, you know, people getting out of hand. And that's, you know, most probably me without realising it, putting my Australian kind of point of view onto that story. Um, but with, with the Salvation series, uh, with the topics it deals with, with religion and technology and violence against women, I think they're very international. You know, whatever country you go to, that's there. So I don't necessarily think that's an, an Australian point of view. But so there's, there's well. kind of more like, there's kind of like more cultural or subconscious influences that you kind of feel are, are probably what make it stick out in, in your work, at least. Yeah. Since you're not you're not writing uh, stuff that's specifically set in Australia, um, you don't have uh, necessarily uh, in the subject. It's it's certainly in, in San Francisco. I mean that that's uh, as you said a, a great example, mm -hmm. and I would say that maybe that's uh, one of the reasons why Australian fiction isn't isn't always highlighted internationally is because of, of kind of a more broad appeal, a universal appeal. 
Um, yeah. So we're wondering, and, and we ask this question to pretty much all of our authors as well, do you have any specific uh, favorites or recommendations in Australian fiction? Well, two favorites um, that come to mind, uh, Max Barry's Lexicon, which you wouldn't necessarily, though I think these, the character is Australian in that, the male character is Australian. I think at some point they do come to Australia, but um, one of the main characters is American as well. But I, I didn't read that and necessarily think that's Australian. Um, and also um, a novel called The Last City by Nina DeLeo. Um, she's, she's, she hasn't released any books for, for several years. Um, we actually shared a publisher at one point, but I quite liked that. And that's kind of cyberpunky, futuristic, um, kind of fantastical elements in there as well. And again, to pick that up and read that, you wouldn't, there's nothing in there to identify it as an Australian book. So they, I mean, maybe that's just, just the way I like things. <laughs> that's not to say I won't write an Australian sci-fi at some point. I would like to. It's just about finding the right story. I've certainly been writing Australian stories with, with my screenwriting, just not necessarily with the, with the speculative fiction novels. Yeah, and we'll, we'll have to ask a little bit about the screenwriting because there's not that much information out there when, at least that I, I could find easily about what kinds of, of writing really happens uh, behind the screen, as it were. Um, but yeah, thank you for those uh, recommendations. Uh, and you talked about like a British and American influence on, on Australia in general, but does that also kind of carry over to the kinds of fiction that inspires your own writing? Uh, and, and even maybe, you know, not just literary fiction, but maybe like television or, or film or, or what are your influences, I guess, is the better question. Um, the honest truth is that the, my, my first love was film. And so a lot of my influences are screen based. And I always I started writing as a teenager and I um, I always said that I was writing the movies in my head as novels. And so I have had people say to me that, oh, it's quite, you know, it's quite visual and it almost reads like a screenplay and I think that's just it's because I've always been writing the movies in my head as novels so um and so um in terms of literature what I was reading at the time as a teenager when I started getting into I was reading more sort of teen angsty stuff like Essie Hinton's Rumblefish and Brett Easton Ellis's Less Than Zero so American authors um and teen angsty not necessarily um spec fic but I think the first speculative fiction novel I remember reading and enjoying was a novel called A String in Time by Irma Chilton. And I've been meaning to reread -re it to see what I liked about it because I haven't read it since I was like in high school. So I have no idea. I can't really vouch for it because I, I can't really remember it. I just remember that was the first novel I remember liking. Um, and that was speculative fiction. But other than that, um, a lot of it is film influences. So, you know, I'm a huge fan of the Alien series. Um, you know, anything, anything, anything sci-fi, I'm there basically, whether it's Star Wars or um, The Matrix and, and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Are, are there any influences then that you kind of come back to again and again? Uh, because that's certainly a trend for some writers is they kind of really have something that they, they watch every year, they read every year. Um, my most watched film is Jaws. <laughs> Jaws is my favourite film of all time. Um, can always watch that till the, till the cows come home. And um, yeah, I've always got time for Aliens. Um, I have, I'm drawn to stories that have um, sort of a team aspect going on. I love it when there's a team that have to pull together to work and, and make it out alive. So those stories, those stories attract me more than like just one solo hero trying to make their way out. Um, so yeah, does that, does that answer your question or did I go off on a complete tangent? Yeah, I, I think that answers <laughs> it pretty well. Um, I definitely wouldn't wouldn't have have guessed that Jaws would be a strong influence uh, on, in a way, but I guess it does also make some sense. I do feel like there's something at least a little bit, uh, I don't know, almost sci-fi about about the idea of like a almost like a super intelligent shark or something. That's kind of like it's not not really what Jaws is about, but it's kind of how we imagine Jaws, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so there is there's something there, I think, uh, and I, I certainly think sci-fi is is in love with monsters, and and I mean Alien is 
is certainly also a kind of uh, sci-fi monster movie in, in some way. So there's certainly uh, some mm. influences that, that might be connected full, at least just like in, in my brain. But uh, of course, it's just always nice to hear about what, what authors are, are consuming as well. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of sci-fi horror films. We'll have to trade some recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, a lot of authors uh, write purely just to entertain others. I mean, that's that's certainly kind of one of the major parts of writing, I'd say. Uh, but do you feel that there's like a special role or uh, kind of a reason that that you write? Um, everyone writes for different reasons. For me, first and foremost, I do write to entertain. I, if, if someone reads one of my stories and emails me and said that I made them laugh or cry or, you know, they were terrified or they couldn't put it down and they're up to three o'clock in the morning, that's just amazing. Um, one, of the, one of the greatest emails I ever had was from a, from a guy in San Francisco, actually, who was reading my Aurora series, book four. There's, there's quite a big event in book four. And he was reading in, a, in the middle of a restaurant and he started crying and the waitress like crying so noticeably that the waitress came over and said, are you all right? And so I was just like, yes, that's just like the greatest guy made a guy cry in the middle of a restaurant. That's like the greatest <laughs> compliment I could possibly get. So whether well, they we say have that it or... here, <laughs> yeah. we have it here. Your, your motivation is to make people cry make in people restaurants. Cry. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, alternatively, I had another um, a student in South Australia email me to say that she had a really tough year, but, you know, book five in the Aurora series, you know, got her through. So when you, when you get emails like that, that's just like, yes, I've, ent I've entertained, I've touched someone, that's great. Um, but it's also good to not just do pure entertainment to kind of get people to, to think as well. And so I think definitely the Salvation series certainly touches on a lot of points to sort of think about, whether it's the religion, religion or technology or the violence against women, um, or just, just the way our society is heading. So yeah, entertainment first, but if you can, if people can leave, put the book down, walk away and still be thinking and processing, that's great. That's a win. I think that makes us, makes a lot of sense and, and wanting to engage with readers, I guess, and, and kind of change how they feel about these uh, bigger topics is, is definitely, I, I think a really kind of a, kind of almost like a noble endeavor, I guess, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I, I would also say that uh, you just said something that I thought was really interesting, which is, uh, you know, the way our society is going. Um, and I, I think that kind of points towards a uh, kind of more global understanding of society than, uh, than I, I'd say a lot of, of more nationalistic writers might have. Um, so I'm kind of wondering, when you talk about our society, are, are you thinking of more uh, the whole Anglophone world? Or are you thinking of, of the West or the, or what are, what are you thinking about when you say uh, our society? I'd say our society in a whole, I think everyone pretty much went through the same thing together at the same time. So in some respects, you might have actually developed a little bit more empathy for some people. You know, we were, a lot of people were trapped in their homes. A lot of people got used to the Zoom interviews, but a lot of people felt more connected because of technology. So there's, with all of these things, whether it's technology or religion, both of them have the means to really connect people, um, but also to the extremes, they can, you know, obviously be quite detrimental to, to people. So, yeah, I think, again, I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> I, th I think you did very well. Um, it also makes me think of, of your own work then in a way, because it really is reaching people, you know, it's reaching people in San Francisco, it's reaching us here in Germany. Uh, it's definitely reaching people in Australia. Uh, so I, I think there's also something to be said about how even art uh, can, can really connect us and bring us together as well. Um, but I, I certainly agree. I think, I think maybe Zoom and, and like video conferences are going to be a shared cultural phenomenon that, that really mm. is truly global uh, in, in, in really shocking ways that I, I don't think anybody would have anticipated. <laughs> mm. I mean, like once upon a time, would this be happening? Would you be able to, would we be able to have this conversation or would it be over email maybe? I don't know. Yeah, and then, or, or over the phone or something like that. Uh, and I, yeah. I can't imagine that, I, I honestly can't imagine that anymore. I, I think that this is really a, a big change. 
So, mm. so I definitely agree with you. Um, and I, I do think there's probably a bigger shift towards the universal that is spurred on by, by the pandemic. Um, but as a writer in general, you, you write, uh, moving on to kind of a different topic, but you write not just novels and, and I, we've already kind of foreshadowed this moment, but you also write some screenplays and, and some short stories. And I'm wondering like, how is the writing process different when you approach a, a given text? Okay, so it, it's, what it really comes down to is the, what story you want to tell and how big it is. If it's obviously going to be something that's going to span years, you're going to go for a novel. Um, if it's just one kind of snapshot in time, it might just be a short story. It depends also the layer, the, the layers of depth that you want to go into a short story, you can pretty much only tell your A story. You have no room to tell B or C stories. With a novel, you've got all the room in the world to develop those subplots and have them really sort of build up the world. Um, and with screenplays, it's more, again, there's only so much you can tell. And that's why a lot of people will complain about how, oh, the book was better than the film. It's because they have to cut out a lot of the subplots and because they've only got so much time. If you think of a novel as like 350 plus pages, a screenplay, it's roughly one page per minute. So, you know, to our film, it's 120 pages that they have to tell the same story. And so it's, it's a matter of you've got to cut out the subplots. You've got to, sometimes you have to combine characters and things like that. So it's, it's just depends on the idea you have. Um, and also like how much time you want to spend on it because obviously it takes months and months to write a novel um, whereas you can do a short story in a day so if it's if it's just just a little idea that you just want to snap out then it will be a short story but if it's something you really want to kind of dig your teeth into definitely a novel and it's got to be something that you really love because it takes so long to do <laughs> So are you, are you kind of an outliner writer then? Do you kind of plan out what you're doing with a, a given idea or, or do you kind of start writing and then kind of discover? I was a bit of a, of a discovery writer until recently. I, I would kind of develop the story, you know, in my mind for several years before I ever put, you know, pen to paper or started tapping at the keyboard. Um, but I would always have like, the characters, the basic story, what's going to happen, and then all the key scenes that were going to happen. And then as I started writing, I'd figure out how I was going to get from one, one big scene to the next as I wrote. So in that respect, I was a bit of a discovery writer. And while doing that, that's where all the subplots would formulate for me. I had the main plot already set to go and all the key scenes, but then the subplots, what, what helps fill in the bits as you get to each key scene. So, um, that's generally the way I write, that these days I am trying to be a little bit more of an outliner, particularly because I've started screenwriting. Um, you definitely need to outline for that because you, you've only got 120 pages to get that story out. So you need to, you need to know where you're going. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm starting to switch a little bit over that way, but there's also the risk where you can spend far too much time on an outline and you're not actually writing the book. So um, each, each case is different. I think you're the first uh, screenwriter and novelist, like both hand in hand that we've, we've interviewed. So I'm wondering kind of how did, how did you become this kind of hybrid uh, writer as well? Well, as I say, my, my first love was film and I, at uh, university I studied film and television and creative writing. It was always my goal really to get involved in the screen industry. Um, but here in Perth, Western Australia, they just, when I finished university many moons ago, um, there wasn't, wasn't many opportunities here. So I kind of went away from it. And then um, years later, I moved to London, England. Um, and while I was there, I started um, doing a lot of film and TV extra work, which kind of just reignited my love for it. Like this, this, I want to do this. I want to tell stories. And so I came back to Australia and then um, I was, the actual moment that got me writing was I was watching the Oscars and Diablo Cody won Best Original Screenplay for Juno. And I just kind of thought, oh, look, you know, what well, if she can do it, why can't I? <laughs> you know, you're gonna aim big. Um, so that was kind of like the, the lightning strike to just say, okay, you're gonna sit down and finally start writing. 
So I started writing um, my first screenplay then, but I realised I hadn't worked out enough of the story. And so I put the screenplay aside and thought, oh, you know what, I'm going to write it as a novel first and figure out what story I'm telling. And then I'll go back and write the screenplay. That novel ended up being my first Aurora book. And before I knew it, I had like six Aurora books out and thought, I never got back to that screenplay. So, and it was so long since university that I basically, in any gap of spare time I have, I've been retraining myself in um, screenplays. So listening to podcasts, reading blog posts, you know, novels, whatever I can do on the, on the topic to, to learn. And so over time, I've just been um, just, yeah, trying to hone the craft, which I'm still doing. I'm not, I'm still not quite there yet, but I've um, was a finalist in a couple of pitch competitions and uh, that the film that I wrote was, which is an Australian set comedy drama that's um, been optioned. So, um, and I'm working on a bunch of other uh, screenplays. Some, some are speculative fiction, some uh, one's an action thriller, um, one's a romantic comedy. So I've always wanted to be a versatile writer. So um, not just across genres, because I like watching all sorts of genres. So naturally I want to write all the different genres. Um, so across genre, but also across the different formats. So that's why novels, screenplays, short stories, um, maybe one day way down the line, comics. Um, so it's, it's, I've just, it's a, it's a good business move to be a versatile writer that you're not just stuck in one lane with one genre. Um, so partly it's business, but also it's partly, it's just something that I'm interested in to, to try all these different formats, see, you know, what I'm good at and, and same with the genres. Do you feel then that there are certain kinds of stories that are, are more suited for maybe spec fic versus, uh, an action thriller or a romantic comedy? Um, well, romantic comedy is kind of. I think more kind of set in what what can be done uh, with speculative fiction, like science fiction. There's so many different subgenres that I think there's like an infinite amount of stories you can tell. So you know whether you're writing something cyberpunk or whether you're writing something post-apocalyptic or whether you're writing a space opera. There's so many different you know different subgenres that can lend themselves to, you know, this one's gonna be a bit more of a thriller or this one's gonna be more of a horror, like a sci-fi horror, sci-fi thriller. Or this one's gonna be a sci-fi adventure. Um, and I think you'll have that less with romantic comedy because romantic comedy, it's partner A meets partner B, they're gonna fall in love and there's gonna be some laughs along the way. And there's, there's not really much else out you can do, I think, with that, but I could be wrong. <laughs> I think that's a that's a good point, though. I mean, speculative fiction, uh, by its very name, is is very speculative, right? There's so much experimentation and and possibility there. That's that's such a big core of the uh, the whole genre, if if we call it that. And I guess that also makes me think then about uh, your forthcoming work, uh, which is a uh, based on on the pandemic board game, and which I feel is kind of also relevant since this is being interviewed during the the whole COVID. Uh, 19 year plus situation <laughs> that we're kind of finding ourselves in. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about that? So um, I was approached by the people at Aconite Books to write, um, did I want to write for them? So I said, sure. So they gave me a bunch of properties that I could uh, write for. And Pandemic was one of the ones I selected. And um, so then I went through a pitching process and got accepted. And so it was great because I, I was lined up to do the first ever pandemic novel. Um, I wrote it in 2019 before the pandemic happened. Um, and I remember doing an edit in January, 2020. I think it was my copy edit. So you have a structural edit then a copy edit. And, you know, watching the news about everything that was happening in China while I'm editing my novel on the pandemic. And oh, it's kind of a bit weird to be, be writing, like editing this while it's happening. It was, it was originally scheduled for June last year, but because the pandemic broke out, it was postponed to September, then March this year. And so now it's been pushed back again to further this year. Um, but it was, yeah, it was, it was great to, to get the board game and, you know, you've got the character roles and to basically 
set up some backstories for each of the characters and set up the organisation and the world um, and, yeah, set, set things up so that other writers can come along and also write in the series. So it was, re it was a really interesting um, experience and I had a lot of fun and I can't wait until I can release the novel. <laughs> we did have to, um, because I wrote it before COVID happened, I did have to go back and do an extra edit to just add references to COVID in there because obviously it's going to be weird releasing a book after COVID and to not mention COVID at all. Um, I can just imagine the reviews now that it's a novel about a pandemic and COVID wasn't mentioned. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's the pandemic story. Yeah. And I, I think that's really intriguing how it's kind of like you're, you're kind of laying the foundation, I guess, for a more expanded uh, I guess universe in, in some way or other in mm. this in this field and do you kind of have to do you find yourself like in close collaboration with publishers or editors then or is it really a lot of uh, almost like collaboration with forthcoming other other works or, or how does that work where you're kind of leaving room to grow uh, in the text that you're writing? Um, well yeah so I kind of had um, to a certain degree sort of open open slather I had to obviously incorporate all the roles of the game. So there's like a lead epidemiologist, you know, all the roles. And um, the, the, I had to the, keep the focus of the game, which is um, working together, the team pulling together, um, which is, I think, one of the great things about the game is that, you know, it, it's, it's one of the few games where people actually work together to win instead of working against each other. So... Um, it's, it's really about keeping that, um, the theme and the heart of the game in the story and yeah, to set up the, introduce all the characters, set things up, but leave enough threads dangling, um, for other people to come in and say, okay, I'm going to take this character now and we're going to explore their background and, and things that have happened in their past and, and, and moving forward with the story. So and um, you've also, so you, you've, you've written this novel about, about one board game, the pandemic one, and I noticed that you also have done some work in the Warhammer 40k kind of universe. So I was just wondering, and this kind of a, a you know, more, more selfish question for me, which is, uh, are you a, a board game gamer or a tabletop gamer? And does that uh, impact your writing at all too then? Or, or is that how you kind of came to write about these things? Or is that unrelated? Actually? No, I um Obviously, as a kid, I played a lot of board games and I haven't played many in my adult life. Um, certainly when I was offered a uh, pandemic and I was offered a couple of the, the IPs, I certainly went out and bought the games and played them and realised just how much board games have changed since I was a kid. They're, they're actually a lot more difficult these days. You're yeah. like, you, know, you know, compared to the simplicity of the, the games when I was a kid, um, it's like, wow, you really need to like be switched on to play these games. Um, so no, it wasn't through me being a tabletop board gamer. It was um, the publisher who set up Aconite had been the publisher at Angry Robot uh, who published the subjugate. Um, so he was happy with my work. Um, so he, he approached me through that. And with Warhammer, I was just approached out of the blue through Twitter. So... Um, and asked if I'd like to write a short story. And I was like, sure. So um, for both of them, I've, you know, done so much research because obviously with, pandem with pandemic, I had to learn all about, you know, the CDC and the WHO and, and viruses and all of that sort of research to get that story done. And then with Warhammer, even though it was a short story, obviously Warhammer's been around for years and there's so much lore to get your head around. So I had to do a massive amount of research on that to figure out, first of all, like which faction do I want to write about? And, and then, you know, trying to get everything right. And so, yeah, so with, with them, there was a lot of um, to and froing to make sure, you know, you get it right because you shut down pretty quick if you don't. <laughs> and is that is that like... Uh... I mean, that, that's got to be a lot different than for writing, you know, writing in your Aurora series, for example, you have like your own lore then to develop it and so on. You can kind of choose mm -hmm. the direction. Um, do you feel a lot more limited in that sense or, or does it still like afford a lot of creative opportunities? Yeah, I find it's, it's there's pros and cons to both. I, I feel that um, 
when you're given like set parameters to write in, sometimes it makes it easier because it's like, okay, this is the world, this is what I have to stick to. Um, so, so in some cases it feels easier, but you have to do a lot of research to make sure you do stay within those parameters. With original work, obviously you can do what you like. So there's a lot of freedom there. And so that's a, that is a, a pro of it. Um, and sometimes there's too much freedom. <laughs> Which way do I go? Um, but no, there's, there's pros and cons to both, I think. So let's move on to talking a little bit about uh, the subjugate, I think, uh, because sure. I, I'm sure most of the people probably listening to this interview have read it, I hope. <laughs> and uh, with that in mind, uh, our, our kind of first question is, is about what we, we already touched on a little bit, which is how the subjugate is set in, in San Francisco. It's set in, in the United States. And I uh, was wondering, you know, what really made you decide to set the story there? Uh, did it really fit the narrative or did you feel that there was, uh, was it more market driven or, or what? Um, because it was going to be a story that heavily involved tech, I, I wanted it to be, you know, in, a, in an area known for its tech, which is obviously the Silicon Valley. So even though there's plenty of tech centres around the world these days, a lot of people recognise Silicon Valley and just being in that vicinity. So that largely dictated. When I first wrote the novel, I just referred to it as the city. But because I um, referred to Stan being from New York um, and, you know, other characters, I thought, the, well, the editor actually suggested you, you, you need to name the city because you name the other cities. So, um, so then I thought, okay, where do, where do I want to set this? And so that's when I, I landed on San Francisco. And also because a natural um, thought might be to have maybe somewhere like LA, um, which is, you know, known for cyberpunky kind of stuff but um i like the idea of sitting in san francisco just really to be a little bit different to not do la and not do new york um plus also the the location of the silicon valley yeah so i guess that kind of kind of answers the follow-up of like uh is it more uh, australian positioned or or globally positioned in the fact that it it was once just kind of called the city and I, I think that's kind of intriguing that the setting itself can change over the editing process as you get a little bit further mm. along. You're like, well, we've named all the other cities. We kind of have to now. Uh, mm, mm. Yeah. And it, it is, it is, it's, it's the, another reason for it is that I could have set it in, say, Sydney, Australia. Um, but, and I'm not quite sure how the populations compare, but I'm, Pretty sure San Francisco is going to have more population than Sydney. Um, could be wrong, I don't know. But um, setting it in the US, it has that more kind of um, that kind of closed in feeling because you have a massive population there. You have, you know, a lot of urban sprawl. It just kind of lends itself more to setting something in the near future with a lot of tech as opposed to Sydney because our population is just just not quite, not quite there to have that sort of claustrophobic feel to it. I think that that's a very, uh, very logical use of setting then really. If you, I mean, certainly when we envision Australia, we don't envision like claustrophobic, we'd probably no. kind of envision the opposite, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, be the best stories to set in Australia, I say, are like ones where wide open space and isolation are like the terror in the story. Um, Obviously, we have our cities and you can set things here, but our cities don't quite compare to some of your big cities in the US. So one thing that uh, I noticed in the subject, subjugate, and we've already kind of already mentioned it a little bit through here, is the, the kind of religious undertones to the story. Uh, not only just with the, the kind of anti-technology uh, people, the, the religious community living in Bountiful, but also uh, the broader kind of world building, I would say, of, of the novel. And... I was wondering uh, if you could elaborate on the kind of relationship between the novel and religious discourses or, or how you, you kind of connect it to, to religion in our contemporary world. Okay, well, first I should say that um, I was actually raised a Catholic. So um, Catholic primary school, uh, an all-girl Catholic high school, went to church every Sunday up until I was about 15. So, um, so I have, I'm very familiar with Catholicism at least. 
and uh, and religion and then the feels of that. Um, so that's kind of what inspired that. Although with the Children of Christ, I never name a particular religion. I don't say it, it's Catholic or it's you know you know one of the others. So I intentionally didn't want to single out any one religion. Just Christian, a Christian religion, um, which I think I think is an interesting topic these days because it's in some ways it's 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 kind of dying out, and I think one of the reasons it is dying out is because of the rise of technology, because a lot of people see what's out there. You know, back in say my parents' generation, they were I think a lot lot more innocent, and they you know, they kind of, to a certain degree, believed what they were told and they just weren't exposed to all the um, opportunities out there, let's say. So I think, um, I certainly don't think religion is bad. I think it's, you know, it's a great thing. The Ten Commandments are a pretty good set of rules to live by. Um, I'm really bad at not using the Lord's name in vain, though. <laughs> uh, but certainly you know don't kill don't kill your neighbor that sort of stuff um but you know anything taken to the extreme is 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 the extreme and um some pe some religions i think do go too far um there's a really good inter interesting uh, documentary i saw called jesus camp where there's this scene where there's like children like 10 and under where they're, they're basically kind of berated until they cry because they're sinners and of the sins they've committed. And you kind of think they're like under 10 years old. What sins could they have committed? And these children are crying because they feel so bad about their sin. And it's, you know, it's things like that. I think where you're taking things to the extreme, not such a, not such a good thing, but um, certainly it's an interesting thing to contrast with technology because you know, people are exposed to a lot more things. They know, I think they have a better sense of right and wrong and, you know, freedoms and, and all that sort of stuff. So, sorry, it's a bit of a bit of a ranty tangent kind of answer, but <laughs> hopefully we got there. I, I, I still I still find it interesting and, and it makes me think really about how uh, you, you do kind of put this kind of binary opposition together between religion and, and technology. And it seems to be connected a lot to information. Uh, but I also really found it quite interesting how the subjugate kind of brings them together as well mm. and shows maybe some of the overlapping points. Mm. Uh, so I was wondering about how you kind of view maybe the religiosity of technology uh, as well to some extent, because that does kind of crop up in the subjugate from time to time. Certainly the, the Soma complex mm. is a great example. Well, it does. And I think it's it's the same when, when we talk about um, extremism that um, it's, if anything can be taken too far and with tech it's it's you know people are researching tech addiction right now and how some people that you know they can't get enough or like oh I've, I've got to jump on my social media I've got to be out there I've got to be showing myself so the to them you know you, you can almost interchange like um you know the the addiction of of technology with the addiction of religion, you know, it's a, it's a strange word to put together, but um, for people who are just so, you know, they, they must be good and they must pray and they must do this, there are some loose kind of uh, correlations between the two, I think. And, but certainly how they can control your life. Technology can control you, religion can control you, so it's, it's a very strong theme in the subject. It is control, whether it's technology or religion or it's um, control over women's bodies. Um, yeah, so lots of, lots of control discussion. Yeah, and I mean, that, that kind of control is, is very uh, part and parcel to the whole kind of cyberpunk genre in general. And you already mentioned a couple of cyberpunky influences, but I was wondering if, if there were other uh, influences you haven't mentioned so far. Uh, along that along those lines um I it was I didn't watch Blade Runner until I was in my 30s and when I did watch Blade Runner I was kind of like 
like it's it's visually very pretty but it didn't it didn't maybe it was just too hyped up for me but I didn't really think it was that great however when I saw Blade Runner 2049 I absolutely loved it absolutely loved it um I'd already written my novel by then so I can't say it's an influence but um it's just interesting to see a lot of and a lot of people didn't like the second Blade Runner whereas I did um but again like and I'm I'm a bad science fiction writer I haven't read William Gibson's novels um you know the, the typical cyberpunk ones you are supposed to I have read Snow Crash I did read Snow Crash um but yeah I I grew up watching you know things like Total Recall and Matrix and Robocop um Minor Minority Report again most of the influences for me come from screen and those are those are definitely uh, certainly the Minority Report uh goes kind of hand in hand with this kind of sci-fi detective novel uh, vibe. And I was wondering how these kind of ideas came together. Uh, so how did you decide to set, uh, maybe to set a detective novel in, in kind of the future? Or how did you de decide to set a future story in the framework of a detective novel? I think that like well, which kind of came first or was it kind of together? Kind of together, together. Um, basically the the kind of the crime thriller or the, the mystery thriller and science fiction are my two favorite genres so I naturally wanted to to play in both those worlds um I I've, I'm a sucker for a good uh, cop tv show or film or book um so it was just a natural natural thing for me that I wanted I wanted to write a cop um in the Aurora series, um, my heroine in that is a sharpshooter in the military. So I've, I've done the military. Um, in the Time of Stripes, um, they're, they're mostly just average, ordinary people. Um, but yeah, I wanted, I wanted to write a cop and a, to write a female cop. And then the, the first inkling that sort of came to me for the subject, it was the song complex and these creepy kind of guys with the shaved heads walking around. So it kind of started with the song complex for me and it built out from there. And I mean, those uh, those subjugates and, and serenes, they really uh, kind of point, I think a, a critical lens on the idea of rehabilitative uh, imprisonment or or of that kind of uh, correctional facility uh, that is, is so often referenced as uh, an effective way to uh, deal with criminals. And I was wondering what inspired you to kind of focus on that because I think so often in, in crime stories or detective fiction, we don't really focus on on prisons at all or imprisonment, right? Mm. Usually they, they're just kind of carted off by the end. I think um, it's, it's another thing is um, I always just liked prison films for some reason. I must be a bit weird. I don't know. But, um, you know, I kind of grew up watching like Stallone's Lock Up and, and you know, Escape from Alcatraz and all these kind of... So I always had a fascination with them. and But it also kind of tied in with um violence in society and where it stems from and how it can be fixed with with the subjugate in particular um I guess I think the idea first stemmed from I remember as a, when I was a teenager going to school I'd pass um a man with Parkinson's walking on the side of the road and he he shook quite quite badly and you know to see years later probably too late for him but to see years later that there were these neural implants that they were using on people suffering from Parkinson's that were, were fixing the, the, were stopping the, the shakes. And to look at that and go, you know, oh, what, isn't that amazing? I wonder what, what, what other neural implants can fix. And to look at um, certainly something like violence, you think, wow, imagine if we can eradicate violence. And I read a study while I was writing the book about, um, uh, violent criminals and particularly those who re-offended they did a lot of um, scans on their brains to study them and they discovered a lot of them actually the areas you know that dealt with sort of repercussions and all that sort of stuff um, they were underdeveloped in certain ways and so there, there was this the study kind of was leaning towards you know a lot of violent people probably actually can't help it because of the way their brain is wired 
Um, and it's the same thing with drug addiction. You know, they've discovered that drug addiction actually changes how the brain is structured. And so again, you think about neural implants and what they could actually do to, you know, to fix these people. Because if, if their brain is, is, has either changed through drug addiction or if it's just not quite the same as other people, for those who are, who are particularly violent, then, you know, we have to intercede somewhere to try and fix it because it's, that's not something that can be fixed otherwise. And, you know, there's going, and as in the subject, there's going to be people who volunteer for the treatment because they, they don't like who they are and they want to fix themselves. And there's going to be others who don't think there's anything wrong with them and society's got the problem. And so they're going to take a little bit more convincing, um, which I guess brings into the, the violence into there. But if, if you look at, like a lot of law enforcement, um, often, you know, people resort to violence to stop violence. And so that, that's another whole can of worms that we won't open. But, um, but yeah, I think it was, just, it was just sort of fascinating to think about neural implants and what they can um, just the, you know, what they could do. So yeah, it's, 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 there's lots there to mine. I definitely agree. I think that brings together so many of the kind of thematic concerns too, like questions of agency over your own body. Obviously, if you have a neural implant uh, shocking you when you have violent urges, uh, that's certainly going to affect uh, your whole your whole decision making and, and really control you, as you said. And, and it really is about control in a lot of different ways and, and maybe who has the right uh, to decide uh, whether people need this kind of treatment or, or this kind of, of reform, I guess. And I, I think that those are all really pivotal questions. Uh, and, and part of that is really juxtaposed against law enforcement, as you've kind of just mentioned, this idea that uh, there's a kind of authority or violence uh, to prevent violence. And we also have, you know, historically, uh, in, in the Western world, at least, especially when you zoom in on, on Christianity, there's also that same kind of stricture and, and connection between uh, religious structures themselves, right? They, they certainly uh, dealt with uh, the treatment of criminals uh, historically. And so we kind of have both these structures that are, are kind of maybe at fault in the subjugate, right? Uh, the conditions that, that create the narrative are uh, the Sohn complex and the very religious town. And both of them are very resistant to law enforcement's uh, interference. And I was wondering if you feel that these kinds of structures are, are kind of especially uh, resistant or hostile to these ideas, or if you're kind of making a broader point about law enforcement in general or how communities respond to them uh, and, and so on? Um, I certainly think that they're two probably of the bigger sort of organisations that um, deal with control, but I do think you can have it in any, any organisation. Um, if people think what they're doing is right and they want to um, keep control over their people or their organisation, they're not going to want outsiders to come in, whether they're police or medical workers or or whoever. And so with with, with Adasom, he, you know, he believes in his program. He can see the results, so he doesn't want anyone interfering with that, even if it's just one bad seed, spoil you know, spoiling it for everyone else. Um, and it's the same with with the religious. They they are almost very righteous that. You know, it's not it's not any of our people because we are we are good and I have a tight control on my flock, and you know this couldn't possibly happen. Um, so I think there are definitely two structures that that deal with that. Um, and and look, law enforcement definitely has its own problems as well. It's it would have to be one of the hardest jobs on the planet, I think, to you know the the things that they see and have to to put up with and deal with. I have a certain sympathy for them, but it also obviously attracts a lot of people who um, have the power trips and they want to control and they, they have a badge that says they can. So um, that's, yeah, it's a whole nother Zoom chat. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just leave it at that, I think. But I, I guess it really points towards a, a kind of broader human condition and question of, of authority and agency and, and really determining uh, what is right and wrong. So often in detective novels, we just have the, the kind of standard order is upheld. So it, it just kind of says, you know, at the end of the day, uh, everything kind of worked, the law enforcement caught the criminals and it's all good. Uh, but you really point out 
in, in a way through that novel, how all three of these mechanisms are, are mechanisms that do not always work. Mm. Uh, they, they are things that aren't perfect. Uh, religious uh, mechanisms have their problems, but, but so does uh, the actual Soam complex, uh, which seems like it should be so straightforward, right? Mm. And it seems like that would be the answer and, and maybe technology will, will solve crime, uh, but you show us uh, that it isn't that simple. We can't reduce it to that. Mm. Mm. And I, I think that's a, a really great point. And I actually was very uh, surprised to learn uh, at some point that it wasn't really intended to be a series. At least that's that's something I read somewhere. I don't know if that's 100% true. Maybe it's not. Um, but I was wondering if when you do approach your writing, uh, you've already mentioned how the Aurora series kind of started and how it just kind of became six books. And I was wondering if uh, you do plan out to write kind of a series or, or have a story that can continue or that is ongoing or if that kind of uh, materializes as you're writing? I definitely set out to write the subject as a standalone, but as I was sort of, it's normally about the three quarter mark when I get into a book and then the, ne the next story is already bubbling away in my head and it's like, oh, that's, oh now it's a series. Um, so yeah, with the Aurora series, it just, it grew and grew and grew. And then by book four, it kind of blew open wide and it became an epic. <laughs> um, I'm actually currently writing book eight so the seven books out for the Aurora series. Uh, with the Salvation series, yeah, it was supposed to only be a standalone. Um, but as I got about three quarters of the way through, I kind of, I already had the murder in the next book in my head. Um, and it's, it's not really a spoiler, but it's it's one of um, Salvi's fellow police officers. So I kind of had that and and it, it, just, let, it just lent itself, because it's a procedural story, you know, you can have a different murder in every book. Um, and that's certainly the way my publisher, you know, wants me to kind of write them as standalones. But with any series of books, for those who do follow from the start, there is like the background kind of arc happening that um, in one way or another infuses into each of the murder stories in each book. So... So it's currently um, planned to be a four book series. So I'm going to start writing book three very soon. Um, and so where book one was set around Bountiful and the Song Complex, book two is set in the city. Um, so we go from the tech free to the, the tech lovers. Um, but you might see some characters from book one appear. So I won't say any more there. Um, and book three is going to be largely set um, around Ghana Town, which has been mentioned in the subject and it comes up again in the sensation. Um, that's one of the survivalist communities. So that book three is kind of going to go back to the tech free community. And then uh, book four is going to be back in the city again. So yeah, I, I definitely felt that when when the survivalist community was mentioned, and it didn't it didn't really come up as a major point in, in the subject. I was like, I wonder if there's something to that you know, and, and so knowing that, you know, it's going to be touched on, I, I think you can kind of see how uh, one story really begets a whole bunch of other narratives too then. Yeah, and if you like, if, if you think about real life, it's not just, you know, you go to work and you come home and that's it. It's, you go to work and you chat with these people and these people have done this and it's like a whole network of events and people and, and faces and places. And so any story really, I think, has the, has the ability to become a series just like real life is it's 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 3d and there's all sorts of things happening so it's just it's the way my brain works anyway but it lends itself nicely to a tv show so hopefully it's um the subject has been option for tv so fingers crossed it goes all the way some very exciting producers involved and um yeah we'll see what happens I, I hope that I hope that there's some success there as well, because it'd be really interesting to kind of juxtapose uh, not only you as a screenwriter novelist and how I would say the novel does have elements of, of kind of screenwriting that are, are tied into it, uh, but having the ability to compare would be very interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. And as we wrap up uh, this interview, uh, we always ask, you know, is there anything that you want to say, any, anything you want to plug or, or leave our, our students with? Well, I, I hope you enjoyed the subjugate. Um, yep, I've, I've mentioned the Aurora series. 
Um, you can find me on social media. I'm on Twitter and Facebook. Um, I have a newsletter that you can sign up to by my website if you'd like. Um, yeah, and I think I think that's it really. Other than to say, as I said to you before we started recording, that um, I have uh, family ancestors from um, what was once Prussia. So um, I, I have a, an affiliation with uh, Germany. So it's, it's, it's very exciting to have done this interview. Yeah, and thank you very much again. It, it's, it was really a great interview. And I think you touched on a lot of uh, questions that are bubbling in our heads, both about the subject, but also just about uh, writing in general and, and how uh, that process informs the narratives that we study. So thank you very much. Thank you.